All right, collection time. I've managed to fit everything into this space right here, just about. Uh, not everything, everything, but rather what I consider the permanent collection, so to speak. Everything except things that I still have to review and that I then want to pass on because I try not to accumulate too much stuff. This is already too much. Uh, I don't actually enjoy having a gigantic collection. I used to, but these days I, it's just its too much clutter. I don't have that much space in the current place. And these are just sharp blades. I've excluded practice swords. Uh, if I were to put these on the pile as well, this would be pretty freaking large because I have quite a number of blunt uh, practice swords. But um, let's just go ahead and take a look. This is not actually sponsored, but I want to help out my friends Nayad and Bernie, whom you may know as Blargity. They set up a website offering CAD and 3D printing services. Any non-commercial 3D model can be printed, and there are plenty of prints already for sale, like tanks, planes, and most of the D&D monster manual. You can also commission artistic and engineering designs, as well as prototyping. I think they deserve more exposure, so check out the site and threaten your friends and family with swords to do the same. Uh, okay, maybe gently persuade them instead. All right, where shall we start? These are not arranged in any particular order. Let's just start left to right. Why not? So here we've got a custom Igorot head hunting axe made by Quinn Waterfield. This is a custom larger two-handed version. Traditionally these were smaller and used with one hand. You've got the spike, sort of like a screwdriver bit at the end, sharpened. This is what you see on some bayonets. And it's of course sharpened here along the edge. And uh, this thing is absolutely devastating. Ridiculously so. I've done some tests with it in the past and it completely wrecks whatever you put in front of it. Doesn't matter if it's soft or a hard target, if it's armor or not, doesn't matter, this thing will make short work of it and uh, do it in quite a spectacular way. Simply because you've got most of the mass at the end here and uh, this concentrates the force on a pretty small surface. It's a rigid blade overall and um, yeah, pretty brutal. At the same time, it's not, it's not really heavy. Like you can swing this around pretty easily. Uh, you gotta watch out, of course, for that spike. Uh, and uh, I like this thing a lot. It's quite well made. Uh, the second version here is stronger because the first one broke. Courtesy of Eric Axebreaker, as you may remember. And it looks vicious, it sure is. And it's just a great piece in the collection. Definitely wouldn't want to part with this one. Another one I wouldn't want to part with, of course, is the Albion Knecht. I think this is still the most expensive sword in my collection, and uh, it hasn't been available for a while. At least I think it's still discontinued. I think they brought it back for a limited time, but it might be sold out again. I haven't checked lately, but either way, this is a lot of money to spend on a sword. If you're asking, is it worth it? It depends on who you ask, of course. To a dedicated collector, absolutely. And this is well worth the money. Uh, would I uh, buy it nowadays in the current economy and everything? No, but I'm very glad to have it. And uh, this, if you don't know this type of sword, it's what's called a Kriegsmesser in German, which means war knife. Um, it's essentially like a long sword, except single-edged, sometimes curved, uh, can also be straight. There's a number of different types, and it's a different kind of construction. I talked about that before with the uh, riveted handle scales rather than a fully wrapped handle. And uh, this little extra guard here called the nagel or nail guard. And this thing is, it looks large, but it's extremely lively in the hand. Like it's not as heavy, anywhere near as heavy as you would think, in fact. Very quick and easy to use. Cuts beautifully, and it's quite a nice looking piece too. Among what I have, this is still one of the most comfortable handles, if not the most comfortable. There's something about this groove here, or fuller if you want to call it that, on a handle scale. It's just the way it's shaped overall, fits the hand beautifully, and uh, it's just a joy to handle overall. All right, and next up we have another sword made by Albion. This is the Gallo Glass. 
It's an Irish design, as you can see by the characteristic ring pommel here. Where you have the exposed hang. It has these subtle but attractive details on the blade here. Just overall very nice looking. This was a gift from a subscriber, which still blows my mind. It's just astonishingly generous, particularly considering how much these are worth. And uh, yeah, it's a sword that I, I wanted for a long time. I always looked at it and just the aesthetics of it and just thought, wow, this is great. And particularly also the handling because this is extremely light. Again, particularly if you look at the size, you wouldn't guess. The weight and balance are really perfect for a hand and a half sword or a bastard sword, as they're also called, because you can easily use this with one hand. I have to very much watch out for the camera here if I swing this around. It's really a cut and thrust blade, so it's not as good of a cutter as some of the others here, but it's quite good in the thrust due to the shape and a very narrow blade overall. Um, I gotta speed up, otherwise I'm never gonna get through this in under three hours. And the scabbard here is uh, barely even worth the name. I just uh, made this as really more of a storage receptacle. As you can see, it doesn't fully fit all the way, but uh, it's good enough for storage, whatever. Then we've got the LK Chen Flying Phoenix, which is a Han Dynasty Jian. As you can see, it's a pretty utilitarian design. A simple cord wrap and the small guard is made of bronze, if I remember correctly. And uh, left pretty simple, you know, nice functional diamond cross section here on the blade. Nothing fancy going on. You've got a disc pommel here. I mentioned how light the previous two swords feel relative to their size and what you might expect. Uh, this is the king of, I can't believe how light it is, pretty much. This, it feels like nothing in the hand. I think this was less than 700 grams, if I remember correctly, or somewhere around 700. Either way, uh, astonishingly light. Uh, this is just, you can just swing this around with a finger or two, no problem. <laughs> it's not just, just look at this. It's... Like, as far as speed is concerned, you really can't beat this. There's no way. Incredibly light. And quite a good cutter, too. Surprised me, actually, how well it cuts for such a relatively narrow blade. Uh, thrusting, of course, great with this. And uh, it's just, yeah, I, I do appreciate the simple functional utilitarian design to it. I also like fancier things, but there's just something about it, you know? It's, very appealing. Just listen to the sound. You can really tell if, if the edge alignment is right. Gives you the sword wind sound. All right, next up we have a basket hilled broadsword. This is what you would actually call a claymore, technically. It was customized by Vaughn Morfett, and, and now it has a beard pretty much. So, pretty cool. I've always liked basket hilled broadswords. Hand protection is never a bad thing. Nowadays, for a collector, of course, that's irrelevant. We don't get into sword fights anymore, fortunately. Uh, if anything, for a blunt sword, this would make more sense in sparring. Hand protection is quite nice. But um, it's just neat to have one of these in the collection because it's one of those quintessential sword types, if you know what I mean. You know, there's, there's just certain... Um, developments throughout history, and this is kind of the, the culmination of, hey, maybe protecting our hand is a good idea. So having something that wraps around the hand where you don't have to worry about how far you stick it out is quite useful, really. But it's not the be all end all. There are other factors to consider, not just hand protection, of course. Some people get really obsessive over guards and would dismiss this, for example, as useless because it doesn't have a guard, or barely. I know because I used to be one of those people. This is a katana longsword hybrid made by Windless Steelcrafts. It was discontinued a long time ago and a subscriber gave this to me as a gift. A really cool design. Uh, it's got something almost sci-fi like to it. You know, the, the shape of the grip here, and you know the way it's got risers going all throughout and then the combination of the 
kind of silver finish guard and the brass riser there and other fittings. It's quite an interesting design overall. Also interesting is the fact that it's double-edged. You know, it is an actual hybrid between the two and it really is. It's, it's not leaning too far in one direction or another. I mean, you could argue uh, it would probably be even more in between if it had maybe like short quillons here as well, rather than just the, the more katana looking discard. But either way, the blade is definitely in between because it's, it's a little bit wider than most katana blades and it's double edged. Of course, has a different kind of uh, blade geometry, but still reminiscent of both. It's got a small pommel, you know, just the small one, not to lean too or step too far into a longsword territory. And uh, it handles definitely kind of like both. I mean, I would say in terms of handling, it's probably closer to a katana, really. In terms of length, it's definitely closer to one. And this would also count as a hand and half sword because it's very light and uh, pretty easy to swing it around with one hand. But for the extra control and uh, power, you can easily use two hands because this is a pretty long handle. So um, quite nice. I like this one. I mean, obviously, I like all of these. Otherwise, they wouldn't be considered part of the permanent collection. But you know what I mean. Then we've got the Scalchen. This was made by That Works for me. Uh, again, as a gift. As you can tell, I've run into some very generous, awesome people over the years. So this is an Italian falchion. It's based on a historical find. And uh, it's, you can see how much work there is in it. They have a video series on the That Works channel showing the making of it. And it was very impressive. Just all the steps and all the work and effort and planning that went into this. You know, it's got so many interesting features like the fullers here. There's a double fuller at the end. You've got these interesting uh, pieces sticking out there of the spine and the guard, the rings here are also not exactly simple. There are plenty of decorative touches, the pommel as well. Absolutely beautiful piece, very nice, great work. The wire wrap as well, also really impressive. In terms of aesthetics and craftsmanship, this is the best one in my collection so far. As there's just nothing else can compete with it in terms of looks. Like it's it's fancy in a good kind of way, and um, it's also extremely powerful as a cutter. It's got a great edge. Although I tend to not use it as much for cutting practice as the others, not just because it's so nice and I don't want to mess it up, but also because it's quite heavy for a, a single-handed sword. Um, heavy relative to other uh, similar single-handed sword designs. Long sword territory. Uh, single-handed ones are usually more like 1 to 1.2, in some cases maybe up to 1.5 kilograms. You know, like some Viking swords, for example, can be heavier. But uh, either way, just absolutely beautiful work. Definitely an eye catcher in this collection, that's for sure. Next up, we've got a Dacian Falks made by Christian Yamandi in Romania. This is not something you see very much on the reproduction market. It's one of those types that not as many people are aware of and that you don't find that many well-made reproductions of. There's some decorations on the wooden handle and you can see the end of the tang here. Overall a very solid blade but also agile. Again, not heavy at all and it has a bit of a distal taper so it thins out toward the tip which uh, helps with the balance of course and uh, the edge is on the inside. It's sickle-like. And uh, th with this point here, you can also strike, which is quite good against soft armor. And uh, of course, the Romans had their encounters with this weapon, rather unpleasant encounters, as you can imagine. So this is definitely a great one to have in the collection because it's unique. You don't see this very much. This is also one of the nicest scabbards I have. It even has my channel logo. The old one, before it was Canadianized and turned into a beaver. 
Some people still haven't noticed that apparently, which is pretty funny. Scabbards are definitely lacking in my collection for the most part. Uh, a lot of swords that I got didn't come with one and uh, I never really bothered to order one separately, which, you know, I really should, but I think this will be pretty difficult to get a scabbard for. Anyway, on to the Landsknecht Emporium Gustav, which I review just recently. I'll try to link everything in the video description. I don't know if it'll let me, if there are enough characters, uh, but I'll try to put the videos there where these showed up, and especially the reviews, of course, and where you can get them, if applicable, if they're still available. So this is another Messer single-handed version in this case. It's got this very handy knuckle guard there, uh, also very comfortable uh, handle, and particularly wide blade. This is a mean cutter right there. It's got the sharpened short edge here, excellent edge overall. And like I said in the review, this quickly became one of my favorites. It's such a great functional design for its intended purpose, which is civilian self-defense. You know, something that they were able to just carry on their hip without it getting in the way too much in the Middle Ages and Renaissance. And it has a well-made scabbard, even with a belt, which is nice. Then we've got a bronze sword made by Neil Burridge in the UK. This is a Ewart Park type with a leaf blade. And this has a bit of history to it. Uh, Neil Burridge asked me to do destructive testing, which of course I did. And uh, then I sent it back, he repaired it and uh, finished it up and sent it back. This is the survivor or I guess the sword reborn, something like that. This also is quite light. I keep saying that, it's just everything is light. Yeah, well, pretty much, almost everything. Because real weapons in history just were no conquerors, weren't supposed to be. So, quite short, as you can tell. Overall, in size, if you see this in a picture, you might get a very wrong idea of the size. Um, because the grip is also pretty short. It's also quite a bit shorter than you would expect and smaller overall. So when you see this without size reference, you can easily assume this is like 150% the size that it is. But uh, yeah, you can j only just about fit the hand on there. In fact, might have to uh, put one finger up here. And yeah, it's such an interesting piece to have in the collection again as sort of a, a look back at this is how swords start there are of course older ones than this they even made swords of copper in the beginning but still just kind of shows you how far technology has come you know not just the material but also design overall you know not that leaf blades are you know obsolete or anything but the hilt in and of itself you can definitely see a lot changed over time and things developed in a very different direction. If you compare this to a basket hill broadsword, couldn't be much more different. All right, next up, we've got a custom sword that I commissioned. I wanted something that's kind of a hybrid between a Messer saber and the Yatagan. And it's got the Messer-like nail guard here. It's got the more saber-like knuckle guard, even though it's a some messers also had them. Uh, it's got this pommel here that sweeps up to kind of hook the fingers in if need be. And the blade is yet again inspired with this recurve. The artist who made this goes by Thinker of Thoughts on DeviantArt. Again, link down below like the others cuts extremely well. At the same time, it also kind of shows the, uh, the pitfalls of uh, going too far with the sharpness. It tapers to a really fine kind of wafer thin edge, uh, which is fantastic against soft targets, you know, like water bottles, uh, soap, tommy mats, etc. cetera. Uh, but it definitely is prone to taking damage against anything harder. The edge is a little bit chewed up there, but for what it is, tatami cutting is a lot of fun, and I do like the design overall. Handles nicely, and uh, yeah, it's definitely a brutal 
cutter. Also, uh, I designed it deliberately so that despite the curvature, the point is still in line with the grip. So I don't know how well you can see that, but if you kind of look down, the, uh, the point is pretty much on the same line as the grip is. So that allows pretty effective thrusts. Then we've got the Zombie Tools Reaver Cleaver, which also has a bit of a history. I tested and reviewed this way back in 2014 or 15 maybe, uh, or rather its predecessor. Um, as I tested it, I was really impressed by just how tough it is. You know, the strength and durability was outstanding. You can tell with such a thick blade. And uh, so I got ambitious and uh, wanted to shoot it, which I did. It uh, stood up to 22 long rifle just fine. Uh, nine millimeter as well. Wait, did I shoot it with nine millimeter? At least I was planning to. And on that fateful day, we were overrun with mosquitoes and we were just losing our patience. So we just went right ahead and uh, ramped it up to 762 by 39, which is really dumb. That's uh, armor piercing rifle ammunition. So yeah, I shot it to pieces and then they made this new one and uh, put this don't shoot sign on there so that my dumbass won't forget this mistake. Obviously zombie apocalypse themed and it makes sense for that. You would want something that is not crazy large that you can carry around, not, not too much difficulty, and something that is um, that lasts, that's not gonna break if you try to split a zombie head, or rather mini. Design is quite nice, very appropriate for an apocalyptic weapon. We've got this bearded axe right here. This is made in Sweden, as you can see right here. And this is made in the traditional way where the, the edge is made of harder steel and the core is uh, originally made of iron. This might be mild steel, I forgot. But either way, this is uh, forge welded into it. And this is the kind of ax that's really more intended as a fighting ax. Sometimes it can be difficult to distinguish a tool ax from a fighting ax. And of course, any ax works as an improvised weapon either way, but uh, this you know, in terms of overall shape, it's not terribly thick and it's kept fairly light that it's not too exhausting to wield uh, on the battlefield. Then right next to it, we've got a war hammer made by Arms and Armor. I guess this is what eBay sellers would refer to as mint condition. <laughs> as you can see, it's been used. I uh, bought it in used condition to begin with, and then I did some armor tests, which left their mark for sure. But overall, it's held up quite nicely. You know, it hasn't cracked and well, I shouldn't say it hasn't cracked. I think there is something, yeah, right here. But uh, nothing serious, I guess it's still holding together. How wouldn't it with such strong langets riveted to it, right? This has a little bit more heft, obviously. Uh, interestingly, it doesn't weigh much more than some of the swords here. Uh, it's also well under a kilogram. But of course, because most of the mass is at the end, this is not exactly a finesse weapon that you would wield with lightning speed. Uh, but as long as you keep the momentum going, you can actually swing it around at reasonable speed. So, um, yeah, not much to say. It's a hammer. Smashing. Then we've got a little spiked hatchet. Uh, this is made by Sharp Blades. Simple and effective. This one is fairly thick compared to some fighting axes, but of course it's a very small head. So you can tell it's a fighting axe by the spike. And because it's so small, the weight is extremely low. Uh, despite the balance, this is a fast one, no doubt about it, because it just I think it weighs only like 400 something grams, something like that. I don't quite remember, but either way, it's, it's very light. Then we've got a javelin throwing spear. This is also made by Arms and Armor. Very small and lightweight. It's got a compact low profile point as well. And uh, it's essentially a pointy stick. There's <laughs> not too much else to say. I find this one kind of odd actually because of just how small and light it is. 
Uh, in fact, this is pretty difficult to get through much. I've done some armor tests with this, and you can always tell it just doesn't have the mass to really penetrate very far. So it's a bit of an oddity. It's one of those things where you would have a bunch of them, I suppose, and you, you, know, you make up for the, the lack of size and mass by sheer quantity. But uh, yeah, against even just pretty simple padded armor, this doesn't really go all that far, but it's kind of neat. <laughs> I, I do like this toothpick here. So now we just have two left. One is this arms and armor spear. It has lugs to prevent over penetration, particularly important on a boar spear. A nice solid socket here is pretty thick actually. And the head is solidly shaped. You can tell that these are not very strongly tapered edges. This is really for thrusting primarily. You can slash with the tip, but it's really primarily for thrusting, of course. And for that, you want something rigid and you know, sturdy that it's not going to be damaged against mail or even heavier armor. Still somewhat underrepresented in uh, a lot of fiction, but uh, it's become more common. Pointy stick, but it's quite a useful pointy stick, for sure. When you really want to stab a mother fluffer, but they're all the way over there, it's got you covered. Not encouraging violence in any way, by the way. Chill out, YouTube. This is just for funsies. Oh, right, we actually have three more. I almost overlooked one. This is the Dane Axe by Arms and Armor. Very easy to distinguish from a tool axe just by how thin it is. If you look at that, that is not a splitting or a felling axe. You already know what I'm going to say about this one. That's right, it's light. Wouldn't really think that if you just see the side profile and can't tell how thin it is. But yes, this is fast. It's not hard at all to do deceptively fast attacks with this one. And you have reach and power. You know, lots of cutting power in this. Finally, actually finally, we've got a disc mace. This is a steel version. In history, they were made of stone. I made a video about that. Pretty simple thing, but quite effective. It doesn't cut so much as it's, mm, shall we say, enhanced smashing. I mean, it can cut, but only up to here when it hits the handle. So uh, pretty interesting. This is not something you normally see. It's quite a rare underestimated weapon and, and mostly unknown. So uh, having one made of steel, it's pretty cool. Um, it's not that much of a, of a looker, so to speak. If it was, this was made of jade or whatever, then yeah, this would be much more eye-catching. But I'm still going to keep it just because it's, it's unique and interesting. And that's that. As said, these are the sharp ones, you know, not including uh, blunt practice blades of any sort. And also not including the ones that I still need to uh, review and that I've been planning to pass on. Uh, speaking of passing on, you know, even though I call it a permanent collection, there's of course no guarantees. This question came up just recently in a live stream actually, where somebody asked, is there anything that I would never ever sell no matter what? And this is not something you can really answer because sometimes life throws curveballs and you got to deal with it. So, you know, who would hang on to something and you know, instead of paying bills or, you know, medical expenses or who knows what other emergency costs. There can always be something happening that forces you to get rid of a bunch of things or everything or who knows what. And uh, in fact, I would really still like to shrink this some more just for convenience because it's that the space is limited here and it makes moving a pain and uh, all of this, but it's hard to really narrow this down further, you know. Oh, I forgot one. Right, the one that doesn't fit in frame no matter what I do, and that is this war scythe, which is currently a war scythe. It started out as a reaper scythe, so it used to be attached like this at a 90 degree angle, 
And uh, then I disassembled it and put it back together like this because I was curious what it would do. And um, it's definitely more effective this way at this kind of angle. So uh, this is pretty cool. <laughs> Takes up a bit of space for sure, but I would like to keep it. Anyway, that's about all. Anyway, this is way too long already. Let's leave it at that. Uh, thanks for watching. Hope you enjoyed it. And have a good one, folks.